And the first thing, uh, one of the first things I learned is that um, dispersions are multi-phase systems that are kinetically stable, not thermodynamically stable. But as time goes on, I think we have uh, increasing numbers of examples where we have multi-phase systems that exhibit uh, thermodynamic stability. And so these are uh, the kind, some of the kinds of things I want to uh, discuss uh, and share with you today. So by uh, thermodynamic, thermodynamic stability, I mean uh, where particle particle interactions may exhibit a shallow attractive well, but that uh, this well is uh, small enough that uh, it can be, uh, that particles can escape from it without uh, too much energy being added. And that the, uh, an attractive uh, aggregating uh, well is basically not accessible. So uh, ordinary liquids uh, satisfy this kind of general molecule, molecule, molecule uh, potential uh, interaction. So this is what I mean by thermodynamic uh, stability. So um, the other key thing about this uh, presentation is that uh, uh, my work in this area over the past uh, uh, 20 years is uh, founded on incorporation of ionic liquid monomers into the polymeric objects and structures. Uh, whether it's the stabilizers that I'm going to describe or the dispersions made with these stabilizers, the ionic liquid uh, liquids incorporated as monomers or, or chain terminators are the fundamentally responsible uh, for their stability and, and some other aspects that I will share. So I, I will first describe some uh, examples from uh, the area of polysiloxanes and then polyurethanes, polyureas, or I, I'll just talk about polyurethanes, but this includes also polyureas. And uh, a new area that we've entered into uh, studying uh, polyesters and then uh, nano latex is made by uh, chain radical polymerization. And uh, most of the examples I'll describe of dispersions using these things as stabilizers uh, are examples uh, from this class. But we're beginning to generate examples from this class and this class. So these, uh, this thermodynamic stability um, results in these uh, um, objects being miscible with many different uh, or with particular solids. So we can define miscibility and immiscibility and, and things in between. And uh, some of them are particularly interesting because they form liquid phases on their own in the absence of any solvent. So you can think of such things as being super molecules that have uh, accessible liquid phases. Uh, so I think this is what is really, uh, I found interesting uh, in the past uh, uh, five years or so. Uh, so the, uh, also some of these, uh, or uh, things I'm going to describe have reactive functionalities, which makes them exotic cross-linking agents that leads to being able to make um, uh, designer thermosets and advanced resins and coatings. So the, the key aspect about the incorporation of ionic liquids is uh, in the case of uh, using ionic liquids derived from imidazolium uh, cations, is that imazolium anion pairs uh, exhibit uh, an immense dynamic range of stability. 
from an uh, of uh, let's say savo felicity or savo phobicity. Uh, so this is uh, this physical property is responsible for tunability that is fundamentally based on uh, or uh, manifested by chain segmental solubility in the in the respective uh, polymers. And uh, it also affects uh, liquidity. And as a preview, let me uh, give an example of what I mean by uh, self dispersion. So uh, the student has just given a little bit of a torque to this vial containing some polyurethane resin. So there's a very uh, mild circulation convection and you see the dispersion, the uh, polyurethane dispersing uh, into the water as evidenced by the turbidity. Okay, so this is a, let's say um, very mild. And in these cases also, when we don't add convection, uh, bounty motion suffices, but this makes it uh, fast enough to see in the presentation. Okay, so this is just a, uh, an illustration of a variety of different classes of thermodynamically stable uh, dispersions and uh, materials. Uh, and I'm, what I'm gonna uh, talk about further today fit into these two classes where we might have some nanoparticle with some feature. Uh, for example, in a few slides, I'll show an example of nano cerium oxide, say two to six nanometers in diameter, that is turned into a uh, supramolecular uh, liquid. Uh, but others include uh, just cross-linked uh, uh, polymers, uh, and the nano latex is fall in this category as, as well as some others I won't uh, 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 describe, but the polyurethanes poly, uh, also fall in this category. And the uh, charges here represent uh, ionic liquid uh, moieties incorporated uh, by uh, condensation polymerization or radical chain polymerization into the respective particles. Uh, it's also noteworthy that we can take nano objects and functionalize them with uh, polymeric chains that when these chains exhibit uh, liquidity, melting, etc., you can make um, supramolecular liquids from them. Uh, for example, if this is a polyethylene oxide or polypropylene oxide uh, and the chains are long enough, uh, such objects will melt, say, uh, below 100 degrees C or below 150 degrees C, depending on the length of the chain. And uh, also I should mention uh, one example I know of in this category that doesn't involve ionic liquids is a, uh, a cross-linked polymer of styrene and poly, um, um, polydivinyl benzene and di, I'm sorry, di, uh, diethylene uh, styrene and, uh, or divinyl uh, benzene, diethylene styrene and styrene coming from uh, the work of uh, Marcus Antonietti who still runs the college chemistry department at Max Planck in uh, Gaume in a uh, suburb of Potsdam. And uh, I think Bresto from now at BSF for many years where he showed that these particles basically melt at about 120 to 150 C. And they proposed this as an alternative method of transport of high polymers by uh, convection rather than by reptation. The, uh, you know, Dejen uh, promoted uh, reptation as a transport mechanism and uh, Presto and uh, uh, Antonietti showed that this could also uh, be uh, transport could originate by convection of such particles at high enough temperature. Uh, 
yeah, I, one other example uh, is combining uh, thermal response with monomers like uh, an isopropyl acrylamid with an ionic liquid uh, monomer to make multi blocks uh, of block copolymers that can reversibly precipitate under heat and salt. Uh, okay, so back to uh, these examples. So the first, uh, in the first class of polysiloxanes uh, initiated with, um, by Dr. Chu uh, when he postdoc with me. Uh, or I should mention that uh, turning um, DNA uh, into uh, room temperature liquids was initiated by Royce Murray, I believe at North Carolina State in the 90s by uh, exchanging the DNA uh, sodium ion for a suitable ammonium cation that had a long enough chain to uh, make a solvent-free liquid. Okay, but then in the um, uh, uh, two th in 2000, um, six or so, uh, Emmanuel Gianellis uh, from Cornell, his student Berlinus, uh, basically invented uh, taking nanoparticles and putting uh, ionic liquid groups on the surface to make uh, supramolecular liquids. So uh, when I saw this work, it occurred to me to, or it's very simple to imagine uh, putting other groups on the surface that are reactive. So the, the, our contribution to this was to add uh, reactive species to the surface also, which turns these uh, molecular liquids into exotic uh, cross-linking agents. So I'll uh, show some examples of this. And uh, I like to say this, uh, this sol-gel condensation chemistry, again, is... Uh, so easy physical chemists can do. So having a, done my PhD in physical chemistry, uh, I was afraid for many, too afraid for many years about venturing into organic synthesis. Uh, now I can do things like uh, make uh, urethane and urea linkages. <laughs> also so simple physical chemists can do. Uh, in any case, uh, these materials form insoluble salts, uh, but when then anide, when you place the, uh, let's say chloride with a, a big uh, soft anion, this turns these things into uh, room temperature liquids, or perhaps very sticky, very extremely high viscosity liquids. So this can be tuned from olive oil to gel. Okay, so here we have just had an example of uh, uh, taking this material and making a, a resin with this uh, tetraacrylate monomer. And uh, we're looking at hardness here as a function of the amount of uh, this species incorporated at the uh, I think one, two, one, two, and five percent. And on, on the top, we made similar control uh, dispersions without the ionic liquid, just by surface functionalizing the silica with the acrylate group. And you can see this uh, uh, relative hardness. Uh, we see, get the same plot if I plot the uh, uh, modulus. Um, we see as the material gets softer, the hardness decreases. Or in the case of the controls, as we add more, the material gets uh, hardness increases. And so the lesson here is, I'm sure many familiar who are working with uh, nanofillers, we're used to dealing with the fact that when we add nanofillers to composite, this tends to uh, embrittle, it increases the modulus, but also increases the uh, embrittlement. So what this uh, illustrates is that 
these nanofluids, of course, when you add a fluid to something, to a solid, it tends to make the solid uh, softer. So this offers insight into how to mitigate, um, uh, mitigate uh, embrittlement uh, by adding enough to uh, make the material tougher, less brittle, without uh, significantly uh, making the material too soft. And uh, so this is made with a, uh, a UV initiated uh, material. We've uh, seen uh, get similar results with uh, polyurethane materials uh, doing similar things. And here's another um, uh, example where we take nanocerium oxide, say in the two to six nanometer diameter range. And again, uh, this was done by uh, a former countryman of uh, Dr. Lima's from uh, Sao Paulo, uh, Rafael Maniglia, but now working uh, for a, uh, a company in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Uh, he, he was <clears throat> he did this work as an undergraduate. Um, so we uh, uh, rather than using silica, he taxed the uh, the uh, this uh, ionic liquid monomer is uh, didesyl methyl uh, ammonio propyl uh, tetraethoxy silane. So you can get this from uh, Gellast as a 40 weight percent uh, solution. And uh, it is essentially, uh, without, the, without the solvent, it also is an ionic liquid, which means, uh, or the definition of ionic liquid, I think accepted uh, universally, is an organic salt that melts below 100 C. So this could be uh, melting at 99C or a room temperature ionic liquid, depending on the, uh, on the particular example. Anyway, this is just a, a, a table of contact graphic where uh, he coated microscope slides with this uh, fluid after activating uh, the slides with the KOH. So we got uh, uh, good coatings and then did the photopolymerization. And this just shows the uh, relatively uh, strong UV absorptivity due to the cerium oxide uh, and relative to uh, the resin with it made without the ceria, uh, relative to the UV absorption of the uh, microscope slide. So uh, th this is an interesting material we hope to commercialize uh, because the cerium oxide at this size has a lot of defects. So it doesn't generate uh, radicals that can chew up the coating. So we believe this has some uh, marketing opportunities or practical applications of stabilizing plastic signs in the uh, exterior environment. Okay, so let's switch gears to uh, uh, Mr. Gupta's uh, thesis work, uh, where we're making uh, polyurethanes, um, in this case, cross-linked either with glycerol, with triglycerol diacrylate, uh, and uh, using either a uh, polyethylene glycol diol, polyethylene glycol, uh, about of a from uh, about 200 uh, Daltons, or uh, tripropylene glycol, from the weight 192. Uh, we used uh, hexamethylene diisocyanate, and then this uh, this is our ionic liquid monomer, hydroxy and desyl methyl uh, imidazolium bromide. And let me stress that. Um, I, these ionic liquids with uh, bromide and chloride counterions love water. Okay, when we get to incorporating iodide, it's uh, much, uh, uh, they begin to uh, become hydrophobic. Uh, anyway, this is another uh, very simple chemistry uh, to execute. And, uh, 
after uh, removing, um, uh, after uh, undergoing reaction and removing the solvent, I uh, showed you in the case of polyethylene glycol already in that introduction, you, know, you already saw this. So this is what happens after uh, a longer time than what I showed on the, on the video. Uh, and then waiting longer, this is the um, kind of uh, dispersion one gets spontaneously if we just wait for Brownian motion to uh, make that chunk disappear. But we can, uh, th th this material still has, uh, there's attractive uh, aggregate uh, or uh, aggregate um, shallow wells that can be, um, uh, dis so further dispersion is, uh, can be provided by sonicating in a uh, ultrasonic bath or show later also by strong sonication. Um, here we're getting like uh, basically 50 nanometer particles by dynamic like scabbing. And another key feature of the, these materials, uh, particularly with the imozoleum ionic liquid based the materials is uh, if we add hexafluorophosphate, for example, as a uh, hydrophobic uh, anion, we see how it causes some limited aggregation. Okay, so this is a key feature for certain applications, if you, um, uh, which you'll see uh, examples of later. Okay, so here, uh, here's uh, an example of, uh, I'm gonna skip this slide, I thought I got rid of it. Uh, now here's an example, example showing how we make 1% as well as 25 weight percent uh, dispersions spontaneously. So this is 1% in water, this is 25% in water. And uh, so after 39 hours, you know, there's no longer any trace of solids. And if we do a little bit of stirring, convective stirring using one of these vibratory stirs, you know, you just push down with the vial and it uh, gives some vibration we get uh, a more uniform uh, dispersion. And then at 25 weight percent, um, here we're using uh, vibratory stirring and, and here we're using bath sonication. But this is basically an example of uh, letting Gibbs free energy be your manufacturing process. So, uh, this gives us an approach to manufacturing without having to use a kinetically stable approach. Uh, since the 80s, when I first uh, learned about polyurethane dispersions, they are manufactured in a, uh, in a pro by a process that depends on uh, kinetic stabilization and if you make a mistake in how you do the chain extension, you can turn your dispersion into uh, a gel. Okay, now here, let's, uh, I'm coming back to the same material now, but rather than 1% or 25%, this is uh, a 10% uh, by solids, spontaneously dispersing polyurethane uh, dispersion. Uh, made by um, uh, bounty motion and uh, hand inversion to get a uh, uniformly disper uh, uniform dispersion. And so here we have, um, uh, this is 10% and we make dilution, serial dilutions and we have a dynamic light scattering sizing, either log normal or multi-mode size dispersions. This, uh, this view or decomposition of the data is interesting because it shows a number of, a number of important facets that um, are important from general dispersion technology and dynamic light scattering. And that is like this, the largest size 
components tend to dominate the visual appearance, okay, because it tends to dominate the scattering. But here we see as we further dilute, okay, there's no sonication here. The, uh, these proportions shift from large to smaller and smaller. So this illustrates that these kinds of materials are really uh, in a supermolecular equilibrium and they're uh, super molecules because as you dilute them, those uh, shallow aggregates or potential attractive potential minima uh, are depopulated to form more and more um, smaller particles. And I should stress these are all volume distribution, volume weight distribution rather than number frequency distribution. If I would do number, show number frequency data, they all look like this or mostly look like this, okay? But uh, it's the large, this stresses the larger particles which dominates the physical appearance of scattering. Now, if we uh, sonicate with more effort, you know, we can take those things and, and uh, break them down into smaller particles. So before uh, the, the main, main smallest mode was at around 14 nanometers, and those could be not, uh, or let's see. My memory's not so good anymore. Okay, it, I guess it's the same, around uh, 15 nanometers. Uh, but uh, this uh, stat, this uh, turbidity here can be almost uh, eliminated by using strong sonication. And uh, so here we see this comparison of number and volume weighting. Uh, so you saw this before. And this is the, uh, when we just look at the number weighting. So my advice to, to people is always try to get number weighting and volume weighting uh, when you can. Because there are examples, uh, let's say manufacturing anyway, uh, where most material may be in small particles. I mean, sorry. Um, where the number of most of the particles may be very, very small, but where most of the mass may be very, very big. Okay, and this can be a problem. Okay, uh, so that's why I make that recommendation. But um, this multi mode uh, size analysis sometimes gives us some uh, nice uh, insight uh, into these uh, processes. And I also mentioned if uh, the things that are scattering here are filtered out, you know, we basically collect this. Uh, you can isolate, you can uh, separate these fractions very simply by very simple uh, filtration. I apologize, uh, Dr. Lima, but the NATO told me I could go over time. Since uh, uh, the doctor that didn't make it uh, today. Okay, so uh, anyway, so here I want to talk about the tripropylene glycol because this is a UV polymerizable material. And so with these particular uh, dispersions, and because of thermodynamic stability, they can um, begin to dissolve if you add water. So, the tri so having a, a chemical linking uh, step uh, may be required if you don't want your materials to uh, wash away in the rain. Uh, but this shows a, uh, uh, a pair of slides, uh, let's say these slides on top of uh, a paper from G analysis group, I believe. Uh, uh, actually, I'm not 100% sure whose paper this is, but we can see that the uh, before uh, doing the stimuli responsive experiment, the coating here, uh, there's no turbidity when uh, photographed on a black background. This is a good way to accentuate turbidity, photograph it against the black background. Unless uh, 
you have a, a very dark oxidized polyethylene uh, uh, or polyester dispersion, which I'll show later, <laughs> that is more brownish and black, and then you need to uh, use the white background. Uh, anyway, uh, and then when we dip this in uh, hexafluorophosphate, the uh, water hating nature of the imazolium hexafluorophosphate causes uh, segmental uh, rearrangements and pore formation in the in this uh, coating that produces a scattering. And then uh, this is seen a little bit more clearly over here. Another aspect uh, is to uh, take a look at the contact angles with uh, the same set of coating. So, uh, you know, at the, the coating that's made had a contact angle of 47. Uh, if we cure the coat, then if we take the cured coating, UV cured coating, and measure the water contact angle, it's 67. Uh, if we uh, cure, take the cured coating and, and um, react it with KPF, aqueous KPF6, as I showed in a previous slide, we get a more, um, slightly more hydrophobic coating, but not very significantly more. Uh, okay. And, uh, but if we uh, first react the uh, KPF6 or with this coating, uh, and then cure it, we get a more hydrophobic uh, coating. So our explanation or rationalization of these data is that when we uh, cure and then uh, add the KPF6, the KPF6, uh, you know, initially will populate surface sites, but continuously is undergoing uh, anion exchange with bromides that are uh, deeper in the uh, in, in the droplet or in the coating. Actually, it's down down here. This is uh, water, and it's a, a, a bit turbid uh, uh, due to this thing about the um, material trying to escape because of its thermodynamic stability. But if we uh, uh, when we first exchange it and then uh, cure it, uh, it can, the KPF6 can penetrate uh, more deeply in the coating. So that's our rationalization for uh, this difference of uh, 20 uh, degrees. Now, if we take uh, some of this polyurethane with the imazolium um, chain terminator, that's the ionic liquid, the hydroxy and decil methyl imazolium bromide, and uh, mix it with uh, some synthetic uh, graphite and sonicate um, strongly. That's with a, um, say, five, four millimeter diameter sonic uh, horn operating around 100 watt uh, input. You know, it's a, a bench scale uh, sonifier for different times, the increase in optical density or neutral density is an indicator for the extent of dispersion of the graphene in the water. And these are, um, uh, this is showing the effective absorption coefficient of 500 nanometers. Uh, but this X is what's obtained when we first sonify in a bass sonicator here. So we start out here, sonify, in a bass sonicator and go from here to here and then strongly sonicate and we're going like this. And, uh, and uh, these data can be fit to an Arami equation, stretched exponential equation. So we'll come back to this, these kind of data a bit later. Uh, we're also uh, studying polyester uh, dispersions Again, using uh, the same tripropylene glycol, the same hydroxy and methyl imazoline bromide, uh, but instead using a dipole chloride uh, to make uh, polyesters. 
which exhibit the same spontaneous uh, dispersion in water. So here, here we have a photo of uh, after we removed all the solvent, added water, and then we see uh, increasing turbidity and uh, or dissolution uh, or dispersion with time. So this uh, this is uh, being done by my student. Um, uh, Ifang Bien, and uh, I believe he'll be graduating in August. He's my last uh, student at Eastern. I took a buyout and resigned in the end of last August, so I'm unemployed, looking for career number four. Uh, so uh, these dispersions also illustrate or exhibit similar stimuli responsiveness that the polyurethanes do. So KCL, uh, like bromide, uh, has very uh, loves water. Iodide be begins to impart uh, hydrophobicity, uh, and hexafluor and uh, hexafluorophosphate even more so. Okay, so. Uh, uh, let's change gears again, making um, nano latexes incorporate a related monomer instead of hydroxy and decil, uh, methyl uh, imidazole and bromide. Let's look at the uh, acrylate uh, homolog. Okay, so uh, we use this along with a little uh, methyl methacrylate to make um, Nano latex is in this corner of this uh, ternary phase diagram. This is just a, uh, this boundary is the emulsion failure boundary. So this is a two phase emulsion uh, domain. The uh, hatched or shaded area is a single phase microemulsion domain. So microemulsions are thermodynamically stable solutions of two divisible materials made visible by a third component, which is back or surfactant, surfactant. In this case, the ionic liquid is a surfactant. Uh, and it's also a, uh, a monomer, a key monomer. Uh, and uh, so it's an alternative approach uh, to making uh, ionic liquid modified uh, polymers. And uh, so this work, work was initiated by uh, Fang Yan, who's uh, now a big shot professor in China at the uh, uh, Suzhou University in Suzhou and also in the Donghua University. So, um, and uh, I usually spend a few weeks or months with him in the summer, which has been uh, I'm just waiting for COVID to back off or for China to reopen so I can get back there. I haven't been since uh, summer of 2019. Anyway, these uh, nano latexes uh, are uh, destabilized by uh, hydrophobic anions. Uh, so with sulfide, I already mentioned bromine chloride, they love water. Uh, but uh, they have this uh, very, very large dynamic range of going to water loving to water hating. And this is because um, you can absorb these nano latexes onto what are, almost whatever you please from suspension. And uh, Phil Pincus, a, an eminent um, colloid physicist um, from University of uh, Santa, California, Santa Barbara, pointed out in 1990 that osmotic brushes are basically the ideal way to stabilize dispersions in water because they make them insensitive, relatively insensitive to salts. Now, when I say salts, I mean indifferent salts in the Dubai hookle sense, where if you just add like uh, latexes, you can destabilize by just adding a lot of sodium chloride. Uh, so uh, here in, in, the, in the absence of added salts, these brushes will swell to their maximum extent. In high salt, the brushes will uh, collapse or condense. Uh, now, in this case, uh, we're taking advantage of so-called ion trapping 
in these uh, brushes uh, where there are specific equilibria uh, involved. Uh, so as you vary the anion, you can quantify uh, the equilibrium constant between these things. So uh, how do I distinguish this from the Bayh-Huckel effects? Uh, and the answer is these things are stable and very high, highly concentrated sodium sulfide at 1.5 molar, that's an ionic strength of 4.5 molar. They're perfectly happy, no precipitation aggregation. Um, but in a sub millimolar hexafluorophosphate, you get this uh, strong uh, imazolium hexafluorophosphate interaction that causes attractive interactions on collision. So this is distinguished from just a general dubai huckle effect, uh, ionic strength effect. Okay, so we take uh, these nanolatexes and disperse uh, multi-wall carbon nanotubes. Uh, it's done by Dr. Ma. And uh, here we're applying the weight ratio of the nanolatex to these multi-wall uh, multi tubes and looking at the effective optical density with, uh, let's say, extensive sonication. And what we find is uh, a, a breakpoint as we increase the, the concentration of multi-wall tubes from 0.5 to 4%, this breakpoint slowly shifts to higher levels, which indicates there's a de facto kind of equilibrium effect, uh, but it isn't extremely large. And it tells us how much, uh, basically how much nano latex or stabilizer we need in order to disperse a given amount of multi-wall tube. Okay, so, uh, so that's critical in terms of making coatings uh, most efficiently. So over here we have some electrical conductivity data uh, for uh, coatings of these multi uh, multi-wall tubes on mulberry paper. Mulberry paper is uh, an artist supply item. We you know we buy at a an artist uh, at a uh, artist or craft shop, uh, but it doesn't have any sizing in it. It's very um, it just has the uh, fibers of uh, from mulberry uh, trees, okay? And uh, I should also show some data, data using uh, fiberglass tissue. But um, here we have uh, a variety of coatings made on mulberry paper by old fashioned paper coating methods, draw down bar. Uh, I like to say uh, using uh, 19th century paper manufacturing approaches, no vacuum uh, systems involved. Except I think the, the nanotubes, I think, may, uh, may have been made in a partial vacuum system uh, by uh, uh, oh, the, I think I think it's a um, uh, an Agfa uh, uh, a company in Germany that uh, made these and then they sold to a US company. Uh, in any case, we see that we can um, get much higher electrical conductivity in the plane of the paper than perpendicular to the paper over here. So that's uh, an isotropy of, uh, of the order, I think, of 500 to 1,000. But more interesting, uh, oh, also, when we uh, have an excess of nanolatex and uh, sediment of nanotubes and look at them by field emission, uh, uh, ionization SEM, they exhibit uh, the saturation absorption. And uh, this is one of these, uh, one picture is worth 10,000 words uh, kinds of things better than cartoons. Uh, we can see the background uh, nanotubes that are electrically conducting, but the nano latexes are ionically conducting. So they tend to charge up in the field, which make, makes them appear uh, uh, like octopus or squid uh, tentacles. Okay, and they're uh, basically, uh, they look like they're randomly close packed on the surface. Okay, so let's uh, look at uh, thermal, uh, thermal conductivity. 
Uh, so we're using a net uh, flash uh, thermal diffusivity instrument. We've got a xenon uh, flash lamp below uh, here. The sample is in the plane of this, uh, just below this device. And the solid state detector is up here and it's cooled by liquid nitrogen, a doer that we access from up here. And uh, here we're looking at a raw detector data versus uh, milliseconds. Uh, the first uh, thermal diffusivity uh, uh, I, I was told about uh, from the students uh, were so high, I didn't believe Netsch's uh, software. And they don't tell you how they, they won't disclose their software. So I couldn't check it. But theoretically, we know that um, uh, thermal diffusivity is also proportional to the in, uh, inverse uh, rise time, uh, often referred to as a T sub 50%, or one over T sub 50%, where uh, T sub 50% is the time it takes to get to half of its maximum. Okay, so um, I'll show those, some data there uh, briefly, but again, this is a, uh, a control carbon fiber paper that we're fitting to a, a by fast Fourier transform. And, and here's, here's a, a, a three milligram per square centimeter coating on mulberry paper. And this spike is just um, uh, what I call flash through. So this is showing the uh, uh, flash through light that oh, we tried to exclude it. We uh, exposed through an aperture and then uh, used the probe to measure a temperature rise radially out from the exposed area on the opposite side. Uh, but there's still uh, some uh, light scattering that comes up and uh, ma manages to uh, diffuse this way and into the detector through these uh, uh, openings in the steel mask that we put over the sample. But this, uh, when I first saw these very large uh, diffusivities, I thought, ah, could that be, uh, I don't believe it. So uh, we went back and measured all those T sub 50s and we plot those inverse T sub 50s versus the uh, software generated uh, thermal diffusion coefficients. We get a, a perfect straight line for four uh, control materials graphite, pyrolytic graphite, silver foil, and that carbon fiber I showed, okay? And we, uh, at this scale, we only see two circles, but if we expand this, we'd see four circles uh, fitting a perfect straight line through zero. And when we extend that 3000%, we get this straight line. And here we have uh, data for six coatings made on mulberry paper, four mulberry paper, and two in fiberglass tissue. So bottom line is that uh, in the plane of the paper coatings or uh, mulberry paper and fiberglass tissue, we're getting point, uh, point 0.5 to almost three kilowatt per meter per Kelvin thermal conductivity, which is uh, thermal conductivity is equal to the thermal diffusivity times the density uh, times the heat capacity. So we measured the heat capacity by uh, modulated DSC for each of the uh, coating materials, but they're all about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 joules per gram per Kelvin. And we measure the densities by just uh, weighing the uh, coatings after drying and uh, measuring the thickness of the coating with the micrometer. About, I think they're uh, 47, uh, might've been 25 millimeters in di uh, diameter. Uh, diameter. Okay, so bottom line is we, we're getting um, the most thermally conductive materials made by man outside of a vacuum chamber in the mid diamond range. Okay, let's switch back to graphene. And so I showed you some data using the polyurethane. Here we're using the nanolatex and this work uh, was done by another undergraduate, uh, uh, David Egger working for BSF. And uh, in the background, we have Lisbon. 
which if you haven't visited Lisbon, I highly recommend uh, it as a, a very nice place. And uh, I recommend the green wine. If you like a dry white wine, I don't think there's a, I doubt if there's a more dry or white wine than, uh, than the green wine made in Spain, Portugal, and uh, I think uh, Chile and Argentina also make this wine. Uh, in any case, this shows a chemical formula in nano latex, but uh, a key thing is the um, uh, this imidazolium monomer. And we've shown that this, uh, these data, this is basically a first order growth process. So we developed an analytical uh, exfoliation model. There's a sequence of first order uh, processes for exfoliation. And these are just these data replotted in a semi logarithmic sense. So we see this, uh, uh, the most lengthy uh, term here is for breaking uh, two sheets into single sheets, and then it's preceded by the, the three sheet, the two sheet uh, process, and which is preceded by like everything else. So, but, you know, basically uh, we can cover th maybe three orders of magnitude or two orders of magnitude by doing this kind of expansion. Uh, and uh, that's all I'll say about, uh, you know, uh, we have this analytical model. Uh, here, here's a, um, a method for uh, when we were checking, uh, checking our uh, results, we're doing, here we're doing a layer by layer assembly of the graphene dispersion with polystyrene sulfonate. Uh, this is a number of bilayers we're making by dipping, uh, washing, rinsing, dipping, rinsing, you know, between uh, dipping it to uh, graphene, dispersion and a polystyrene uh, sulfonate solution. Uh, so um, using, uh, uh, using our data, we, this allowed us to uh, estimate, on average, we have maybe 1.6 sheets of graphene uh, per uh, bilayer. And we have this uh, absorption coefficient of 500, uh, at 500 nanometers, uh, which is about half what we get with uh, pristine graphene as made by Daim Kosolov at Al at Manchester. Uh, of all the other workers exfoliating graphene and water, all the other solvents. Uh, no one has really reported an absorption coefficient above, say, 30 or so, uh, although most of them claim it's pristine graphene. So we don't claim our graphene is pristine because its absorption coefficient has been eroded from the, uh, also like 150, well, the theoretical uh, absorption coefficient from the main contribution of this intra-shell uh, transition of graphene is about 136 centimeters squared per milligram. And we add another uh, 10 to 15 from a, uh, the tail of a pi pi star transition. That's at about four, uh, 4.5 EV. Okay, so uh, we don't claim pristine, but we claim it, uh, it's higher than anybody else's. Okay, so here's a very important uh, phenomenon from a composite perspective. We can take our stable dispersion of the graphene and destabilize it with say, uh, sodium dicyano image. We can collect these, uh, uh, this material, filter it, can make a, a graphene uh, paper, and then uh, break it up, and put it in acetone and uh, sonicate a little bit, but we put it back in uh, suspension. So this is showing how you can reverse it, you can, uh, and then uh, uh, destabilize it with bromide, tetrabutylmoine bromide, and collect this by filtration, and then put it back in water and redisperse it. So we have demonstrated this uh, cyclic treatment 
using this destabilization. The, the practical importance here is that you can make, uh, make these materials in water, so they're very stable, and then by uh, anion exchange, make them suitable for any other place you want to put them by finding or, or using the, uh, uh, some other anion to modify their um, Savo uh, felicity or Savo uh, phobicity. Uh, if we just filter them on, a, on an anapore uh, alumina filter, here you see this, uh, these layers. And here for different thicknesses, uh, we're showing we're getting about four centimeters uh, per centimeter electrical conductivity, which certainly many orders of magnitude below the peak. But keep in mind that um, these things are covered with the nano latexes that tend to provide, are not electrically conducting. So this is a uh, development opportunity for uh, hopefully to make a simple way of making a replacement for indium tenoxide from a much cheaper and, uh, and limited material. So I want to more or less uh, finish with some more, much more recent results where we're uh, uh, doing electrospinning of graphene and multi-wall carbon nanotube dispersions done by uh, Li Chi, who's now a young professor in Nanpong. Uh, and uh, this is a kind of control material we get from the polyvinyl alcohol carrier fluid. And if we look at a SEM of a graphene dispersion, we get this. If we uh, do electro spraying without any uh, ionic, uh, uh, without any uh, polyvinyl alcohol added, we get something looks just like the, uh, disp uh, the dispersion. And when you look closely enough, you can see the uh, nano latexes on the surface, which is uh, maybe a different story. Uh, but when we put everything together, have a good uh, carrier uh, polymer, like polyvinyl alcohol, and begin to modify the ratio of the, of the PVA to the graphene, we see the emergence of uh, the basic anisotropy of the graphene it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So here, and we've gone to uh, 0 0.5 to 1 to 0.5. So uh, this is important because now we have a way to make nanostructured coatings that uh, if we can improve our electrical conductivity, con uh, connectivity, uh, these will provide transformational uh, electrode manufacturing processes for catalysis, batteries, and uh, I think also for uh, solar cells. Now, we, uh, and if we do the similar thing with multi-wall tubes, Now, there's no two-dimensional object in a PVA nano latex multi-wall tube suspension. So I'd like to uh, talk about this work by saying zero plus one equals two. Because we see two emerging quite early, but we didn't put any two, anything that's 2D into this system. So our current hypothesis is that the uh, one-dimensional films somehow in concert with the zero-dimensional nano latencies, they're about 20 nanometers, 25 nanometers in diameter, produce a framework in which we're spreading uh, PVA films. Anyway, so my, uh, what you heard me just say, I have to say is in the category of hand-waving. But we'll, you know, with time, we'll find out. But this is uh, where I want to, uh, well, I, like most speakers, I lied. I'm not ending here. Uh, so some things we're beginning to look at is using our uh, reactive uh, nanofluids to develop new bottom-up uh, added manufacturing or 3D printing uh, technologies. 
because we can vary the, react the reactive groups on those uh, fluids that we described. And uh, we're beginning to formulate uh, a new class of nanozymes by taking our, uh, our polyurethane and polyester dispersants ideally suited for including things by condensation polymerization by, uh, by incorporating uh, pockets or active sites in these uh, uh, liquid uh, polymers that form uh, stable particles. So uh, hopefully by next year, we'll have uh, some actual catalysis uh, to talk about using these uh, nanozymes. So now I really am finished. I'd be happy to entertain any questions if time permits, Madam Chair. So thank you, Dr. Dexter. Uh, we would be open for questions. We have uh, time for one question. Only one question. Oh, one question. Uh, you mentioned we use uh, uh, mark and wall carbon nanotubes to coat paper. And then you see strong anisotropy in conductivity, perpendicular uh, or parallel to the surface. Uh, can you have some explanation on such a Sure. Um, so thank you for the question. Uh, <clears throat> when we uh, increase and increase the loading, this anisotropy disappears. So the basic anisotropy is provided by the substrate fibers. Okay. So in uh, since the uh, so whether it's a fiberglass or the mulberry paper, it's a two, the paper is a two-dimensional object. And the net uh, orientation of all the fibers is in the plane. And when you take a 10 micron nanotube, it's easier for the nanotube to align on average parallel to the fibers than uh, wrapping around. The texture of the substrate actually makes a difference. Yes, and I mean, and the and the micro uh, 